Welcome, everybody. I am so excited to have you all here. And I know some of you were um, with us last night at the, the School of Business and at the reception at the Butter, Buttercup Cafe. Um, I'm Jenny Mish. I'm the director, the executive director of the Sustainable Business Council here in Missoula. And uh, our mission is to advance a vibrant local economy built on sustainable practices. And I'm here because I love Missoula. I'm one of many people who come back because I love Missoula. I love the landscapes and I love the people and the community. And uh, so I know you all love those things as well. And um, uh, we've had a wonderful couple of days with Judy Wicks here. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about her um, in a minute. Um, but I wanted to um, start. So. To find out about our marketing, I, I didn't do this last night, but I wanted to know how many of you saw this poster? So quite a few people saw it. Did you get an email from us? Yes. Most people got emails from us. How, did you visit our website? A few people? And um, how about did you see a, a, our Facebook? How about did you see an ad in the Missoulian? Or the Independent? Or Mamalod? Couple from Mamalod, yeah. Did you hear us on the radio? Yes. Yeah. And word of mouth? Yes. Lots of yeses. Okay. So you know that's our market research. We have to do that, <laughs> as you well know. <laughs> well, I didn't want to bother you with surveys. Yes. I actually came in through the Missoula Community News. Missoula Community News. Thank you for adding that to my list. Very important. Wonderful member organization and wonderful organization. So we have a number of events coming up and I think everybody got a program and a list of upcoming events. I just want to briefly highlight a couple of them. We're going to be doing um, on April 23rd a film at the Roxy which is going to be about um, the LEED certification for green buildings and a group of construction workers that kind of grapple with it and kind of are, you know, it's a fun, fun film to watch this kind of cross-cultural aspect of getting to know what green building is about and kind of coming around to seeing how this makes sense. So um, I, hope, I think that'll be fun. We're also on May 8th doing um, a farm fresh pitch fest with CFAC, which is the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition. And we're really excited about uh, taking a foray into highlighting some local businesses, giving them a chance to do a pitch for, about their business and invite the community to you know, hear about their innovations and think about ways to support them. And um, that's a little first foray for us. And we hope to get involved in more opportunities to kind of find ways to help um, businesses highlight what they're doing so that the community can offer more support to specific businesses. So those are a couple things coming up. Also this summer we're going to be asking Missoulians to make a 10% pledge to buying local food. So stay tuned for lots more on that. Very exciting. Um, we have wonderful sponsors as I'm sure you all are aware. Um, and I want to thank each and every one of them. Axiom. IT Solutions has been fantastic. Balance Tech has been amazing. Um, uh, the Missoulian and Mamalode um, have been fantastic supporters um, of these events. Um, the University of Montana, both the School of Business and also UM Dining Services separately have supported this, these events, which we really appreciate. Um, we have support, obviously, from the loft here and the wonderful food from Bernice's this morning. We got support from um, the Good Food Store and Cherry Creek Radio and the Green Light downtown. We've got, um, the, and we also had this lovely um, reception yesterday at the Buttercup sponsored by Molly Galusha. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Did I miss anybody? First Interstate Bank is also one of our sponsors for this event series. So thanks, thanks, thanks. Thanks to our members and thanks to all those. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's the preliminaries. Now I want to introduce our panelists. And what the format will be is that each of our panelists will speak for 10 minutes um, and then there will be Q&A. So um, uh, uh, hopefully we'll have time, some good time for Q&A. Um, what we wanted to do was to gather, since Judy is, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about her, but since she's such a... Um, pioneer of, of really innovative local business models. We wanted to highlight some of our pioneers of local business models. So we have invited um, three 
um, uh, businesses, business owners who, who have done really innovative things. And we hope that they'll share some of that. And we're just going to get glimpses. Um, Mark Vandermeer um, is here from Bad Goat Forest Products. And um, we've got Carol Lopatka of Recreate Designs and also of the Ma Maid Fair that many of us are familiar with. And we have Paul Gladen, whose business is Muse View, and he, um, which is a... a I'll explain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's good at that. And who, who you probably are also familiar is the new director of the Launchpad Initiative, which he's going to speak a little bit about um, as well. So now I get to tell about our special guest, Judy Wicks, who many of you have um, heard a little bit about. And um, if you had um, seen her talk last night, um, you would know that she uh, founded the Free People Store, which became Urban Out Outfitters, which is a really interesting story. And she's best known for her cafe, the White Dog Cafe in Philadelphia. Um, where um, the Inc. magazine said that she implemented um, more <coughs> progressive business practices per square foot than any other entrepreneur. They called her one of their 25 most fascinating entrepreneurs, and she tells great stories about this. So today you're just going to get some little snippets, but um, her talk last night will eventually be on YouTube, and you can also read all, all about it in her new book, which is um, Good Morning, Beautiful Business. So. Um, uh, she'll be available signing that afterwards. Um, she also founded the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, which is the national organization that really talks about how we build economies that are, are, net, are ecosystems of cooperative small businesses that, um, at, that support each other and consumers and you know the whole community that really works together to, to create really vibrant local economies. So. She'll say as much as she's able to say in her 10 minutes, and without <laughs> taking up more of it, I think I will now start um, uh, the panel. So I'll, I'll, we'll start with Mark Vandermeer. Right. And so here is this your microphone, and you can flip it or wear it or hold it, whatever you want to do. You can do it, please. I'm going to stand over here. All right. Ready? Yeah. My name is Mark Vandermeer. I'm here representing Bad Goat Forest Products. Uh, Pedro Marquez right there is our general manager. He's the guy who holds all the everything together. This is a fast, fast slideshow. And uh, so hold on. It's going to be like going down whitewater. I've, I've only got one request. Keep your eye on the wood. That's all you got to do and you won't get confused. Just grab, wrap onto a log and you'll be fine. All right. We'll see how this works. Bad Goat. I should hold on back up. This is not the story of just Bad Goat. This is the story of three businesses that work very closely together. These three businesses, Watershed Consulting, Wildland Conservation Services, and then finally Bad Goat. And I'll explain. Watershed Consulting does a lot of different stuff out in the woods. Uh, we do environmental assessments of all kinds. We do soils work. We do ecologic restoration. That's the big thing we do. 90% of what we do is ecologic restoration. We fix stuff that's screwed up. Does that look screwed up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's us having fun. What we do best, or one of the things we do best, is forest restoration. Forest restoration. Remember I said, hold on to the logs. This is where our wood comes from. This is where Bad Goat gets its wood. And we work all over western Montana. We're out there right now. Uh, sawing trees down for a good reason. Always for a good reason. True forest restoration. There's us doing stuff, having fun again. Then there's Wildland Conservation Services. This is where the sawmill comes in. We also have a native plant nursery, but you don't need to know that. There it is, pretty. That's the sawmill. This is where the action happens. Uh, this is under the Scott Street Bridge here in Missoula, the north side of the Scott Street Bridge. You've heard of the troll over there under the bridge? That's me. <laughs> yeah. There's the, the mastermind behind the sawmill, our foreman, Dave Duran. There's the saw. Looks dangerous, it is. Product out of uh, nasty logs from forest restoration projects. A little bit of action down there at the mill. And we can take an ugly log and make it pretty. Yeah, that thing would have been in a, in a slash pile and burned up. We also uh, have four arborists on staff and we, uh, we use urban wood. If I could pay attention to one topic, I could make a living just on log in Missoula. That's it. More urban wood, good stuff, beautiful stuff. 
More urban wood? Big slabs? Great product. We dry stuff in the shade. We air dry everything. These, these things here take almost two years to dry. Now, bad goat forest products. How does this tie in? Bad goat takes that wood, actually purchases that wood from the sawmill guys. And we sell sustainably harvested, locally grown wood. People want to know where their wood comes from these days. And uh, now you know where it comes from. It comes from forest restoration projects and from our urban forests. A little bit of product there. And now what I'm going to do is fly through a bunch of stuff that we do with that wood. Not only do we sell it, we do stuff with it. The best way to sell wood is to add value to it. And we have a collective of artisans around the community who use our wood in various things. And we have um, our own people right on staff doing it as well. We like to design and build barns. We love timber framing. We like barns and saunas and sheds because they use lots of wood on one whack. And we can build with green wood. And to be honest, uh, the wood we use is a, is, is a little bit hard to use because it comes from forest restoration projects. It's not the greatest, they're not the greatest trees on earth. Some stuff downtown at the uh, Front Street Market. Look at that. That is nice stuff. I can't believe what these uh, artisans can do with this wood. Love timber framing. Barns. That's a nice one. Barn from the back. More sheds. You'll see our sheds all over the place. Sauna. Greenhouses. Love greenhouses. Greenhouse on the move. <laughs> Chapel greenhouse. I call this the Church of Greenhouses. Uh, this is a forge up in the Swan Valley, Blacksmith Forge. We can put these timber frames in tight spots because uh, most of it's hand built. Outhouses, need an outhouse? Uh, some cool joinery, you'll see this out at the Laughing Grizzly. We have lots of stuff all over town. You'll start to see our products in, in a whole bunch of different stores. Local brewery, this is their work table. Uh, it's got a steel front to it to really bang things around. Sturdy stuff. That's a tea table from uh, uh, Lake Missoula Tea Company. That's our workshop. Ha ha, that's our workshop when we clean it up. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, there it is. There's our workshop when things are happening. Yeah, we've got sawdust everywhere. Uh, we do a little metal work. We built sidewalks. We make cool stuff. That was a rotten piece of log. Rotten, rotten, rotten. That thing sold for 1,200 bucks. Some more stuff we build. We kick stuff out every day. We build picnic tables for the city. More stuff. Kitchens. Inspired classroom. Skateboards. Who would have thought? Huh. And here, <laughs> Caleb Matthews. He gets the award for the most value added. Took 87 cents worth of wood and made 40 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> That's it. Wow. Um, also, at Bad Goat, they have a new uh, shared workspace where they've got. We'll be starting to see some First Friday events there, and in an artist space that's kind of a woodworker, you know, kind of shared environment. So, stay tuned for more of that. May second. May second. First Friday in May. Is cool. What we're trying to shoot for. And where is that location? It's it's thirteen oh one Scott Street. It's. Okay. In the zip, you know where the zip beverage, mm -hmm. beverage distributor is? Uh, we're in their complex. Great, thanks. Now look for sawdust. <laughs> smell it, maybe. Scott, Scott, Bridge, look to your left, you'll see the logs. Great. Follow Carol. the smell of pride. Thanks for that whirlwind tour, Mark. <laughs> Next up, Carolyn Lapotka. Hi, uh, my name's Carolyn Lapotka. I'm going to sit down. I'm pregnant and get winded just standing. So um, that's my website. I have a little slideshow you can kind of glance at while I talk. Um, it also helps me time my presentation as well. Um, I'm a little too tech savvy, I think, to plug things into computers. So I have to do fancier things like on iPads. Anyways, um, I'm going to uh, briefly talk about two of the organizations and businesses I'm involved in. Um, Recreate Designs is my little baby. Um, we've been in business for over nine years. I started in um, Wisconsin, in Madison, Wisconsin. and it was a part-time kind of thing, more of like a, I'm going to do a street show here, maybe a little craft fair there. And it's, um, our main business model is we take a product, 
put some effort and time into it and make it into something else. So it's reclaiming um, secondhand goods and repurposing them into products that are acceptable in kind of the mainstream marketplace. Um, it's kind of an underlying message of, hey, it's recycled, without shouting it too loud or having it look um, too recycled. <laughs> um, so I moved to uh, Montana um, in 2007, I believe is when I moved. My husband was going to law school here, and so it was a, I had to move, not a, I really liked Madison, Wisconsin, but my, um, Missoula, Montana is pretty awesome as well. We've got mountains instead of lakes. Um, and I developed um, my business slowly and sustainably. Um, I didn't just quit my job. Um, when I moved here, I had a, a full-time job job, I call it, just to pay all of our bills since one was in school and so on and so forth. Um, and so I kind of was doing it on the side, but within a year, it soon became a full-time venture. Um, and it started you know, originally in the basement of my apartment in Madison, Wisconsin, and then in my student housing apartment, where I'm sure my neighbors did not appreciate some of the noise I made. And then um, I started to, to move into other larger spaces. Um, the first handmade show I did in Madison, Wisconsin, um, I, the thing I make most are these t-shirt skirts. It's kind of a, um, what I'm mo most known for and how everything kind of started. It's reclaiming um, an old t-shirt uh, using a design pattern I made myself and making it into a skirt that is very flattering on a lot of body types and um, just kind of cute and fun. Um, and the first show we did, we sold out right away. And so I knew this might be onto something here. So I kind of developed it a little bit more and continued to work on um, the basic stuff when I moved to Montana. Um, and I grew up in a very supportive and creative environment. My dad grew up during the Great Depression. And so we never got rid of everything. Our house looked like that sometimes. But um, I had an entrepreneurial spirit at a very young age and kind of developed that um, through my business. Um, the artist community in Missoula is amazing. Um, and very supportive. In Madison, I participated in like the farmers markets and that kind of thing, and it was it was great there. But here, it was overwhelming. And within a few months of living here, I, I knew that I could launch, um, have enough in the savings account. But I knew it would be a success. Um, from the beginning, we made a very conscious decision to reuse materials and upcycle everything. I could have taken my designs and patterns, bought bolts of fabric from wherever, made the same product made things in China and then had them shipped and it'd be a lot easier because <laughs> um, everything is one of a kind. So there are some struggles I go through to, um, to make the products. Um, uh, we source the majority of our raw materials from local secondhand stores and upcycle them. We have an adult and children's clothing line as well as books and bags and accessories. I um, started originally with adults, and then after I had my first child about four years ago, I couldn't find things that were cute but not ridiculous. Um, so I was a girl, and <laughs> so I started making a couple of things um, after she was born and, and prior to her birth. So it really inspired me. Um, and I did notice that a lot of children's clothing was um, either poorly constructed or just kind of stupid and pastel -y with dinosaurs and just, mm -hmm. just not um, fun. And so I developed several patterns where the, the clothing and stuff would um, be uh, fairly versatile. Things are reversible, they're well constructed, and the sleeves are longer so they can wear it for an additional year or two. So a pair of, I make these pants called fancy pants, they're just large enough in the butt for a cloth diaper. Um, and they have long legs, so they can be folded up to start with, and then, like, my four-year-old still can wear her two-year-old pants. She's small, but she still can wear them, so it's kind of nice to have that versatility. Um, and we also do some books that are made out of 100% um, recycled paper, old books, and then um, lots of random bits and pieces from, like, board games, card, decks of cards, um, just random stuff. And uh, there's just a lot of stuff out there, and I joke that anything can be turned into three things. You can make it into a clock, even an air conditioner. You can make that into a clock. Um, <laughs> you can do a clock, a tote bag, or a book. So anything that you find lying around, you could easily make into those three things. So I, it, it becomes a problem when I 
counter like p not really piles of trash but just stuff and I'm like my brain kind of goes a little crazy but I have limited my product line to things that I can reproduce on a fairly regular basis because a discarded air conditioner is a little <laughs> trickier to find. Um, uh, so our main business model is to um, you know, take these, these secondhand, I call them my raw materials, and transform them into something that is um, available um, to the general public and has a recycling message, but it's not so overwhelming that it looks stupid, it's going to fall apart, um, or is not attractive. Um, and I don't have any formal business training. Like I said, I've been a little entrepreneur since I was a kid. I sold flowers to people from their own front lawns when I was a kid <laughs> around the neighborhood to get 10 cents to go buy some lemon drops. So as started young, um, and my, <laughs> my family and father and stuff um, really inspired me to, to try to do things in a more interesting way, I guess. Um, I've had a little help from MCDC here in town and the business school. They did um, use me as a case study as to how to expand and size a business like mine. Since everything's one of a kind, you have to, and it's not easier or cheaper to get a t-shirt from a thrift store and turn it into a product that doesn't look like it was stained <laughs> or pilled or anything like that. So it's, it is a challenge to, to expand it and I'm still kind of working with that. Um, I added, I have about three employees, some are full-time, some are part-time, so it's from, you know, my basement um, to where I am now, it's a pretty big growth. I'd like to continue to grow, um, and it's, it, it's a little bit of a struggle trying to find that supply chain that can um, keep me um, getting larger if I choose to. Um, I noticed that there's an emerging market of upcycled goods in the local and the national marketplace. And I wanted to participate in this growth. Um, there's actually hard to, a lot of people like me, are, it's, it's starting to become hard um, to find the actual raw supplies, like secondhand supplies, <laughs> because everyone is starting to do this, which is amazing and fantastic. But um, it's something that you know, I'm aware of and something I'm trying to work on. Um, one thing in the process of making stuff, I've, I discovered I have all these extra things, like you. Make a triangle out of a t-shirt. What'd you end up with? Two sleeves. So you do this over and over and over again. Pretty soon you could have a whole room of sleeves. So I, um, last year I started designing some new products that would use six sleeves, so to help with the supply chain, and then, um, or the material supply. And then anything else that's big enough, um, I give to someone else to use as rags and scraps. So I try to keep everything in process of moving to something else versus just going into a landfill. Um, <clears throat> I sell at the local people's market here in Missoula on Saturdays and I have stuff on um, my website although that's really there's not a lot on there right now because I've um, it's hard when you have a lot going on I try to focus on certain things last year was developing more wholesale accounts and um, I have some consignment accounts and this year is going to be developing the website it's beautiful but it, the pro if you actually look at the products, it's like, hey, here's a choice of skirt one or two. <laughs> so this year is really focusing on that since I'm expecting another one. Um, I have to try to come up with some more things I can do from the home. Um, and this year, um, we've applied and have been accepted, just had to finish the paperwork, to participate in 1% for the Planet program. Um, it's a, uh, it's a connects businesses, consumers, and nonprofits. Um, and I'm dedicating 1% of my sales, not my profit, my sales, um, to local nonprofits that do something that I don't have time to do, um, help out the environment, um, be advocates for things that I, I can't do myself. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and the next thing I'm going to talk about, because my thing stopped telling me that I should stop talking about that, um, <laughs> is the Maid Fair. And this is my little baby as well. Um, make sure my music doesn't start playing. Um, so the Maid Fair, it's an alternative arts, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> yes, let's listen to that music. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, the, it's an alternative arts and crafts fair um, that I started less than eight years ago. It'll be the eighth holiday show this year. Um, and we started off with 18 vendors. It was above a bar and restaurant 
and it was actually called the loft, but the different one. Um, and we started off with 18 vendors at it, and it was a way to um, just be able to sell our stuff. Um, I participated in similar events in Madison, Wisconsin, where it was an alternative arts and crafts kind of fair. And kind of the quirkier things that you see out there, so not the traditional arts and crafts that you would see at the church bazaar type thing. So it was more um, interesting things. And I w there was um, something kind of similar here, but I wanted to kind of grow it into something that could be big and huge. I had a vision, and we're slowly getting there, which is exciting. Um, so we started out with 18 artists. We did pretty much all of our advertising, virtually, socially, um, handouts. So we didn't know if anyone was actually going to come. So it was a little nerve-wracking at first, and there were some hiccups along the way. But it was amazing. It was a huge success. Um, everyone that participated, you know, sold their products really well, and it was well attended. Um, and since then, we've, you know, fast forward a lot of years, um, our show last um, holiday was at the Adams Center. It was something that I had in my, you know, thought process that it'd be great to attain a larger space like that one day, but I knew starting with 18 vendors going to 140 was not the, the best leap to start with. Um, so we kind of grew it organically. Um, a lot of social media, I think, definitely helped out. Facebook was a huge thing for us. Um, I'm one of the co-founders, and then currently we have two other people that are helping out with the planning and organization of it. Um, and every year we receive twice as many applications as we do um, have space for. And last holiday, over $250,000 stayed within the Adams Center in the local pockets of local and regional artists. There's only two artists from um, Idaho. They kind of been grandfathered in, but um, <laughs> so everyone else is um, pretty much local or from um, at least Montana. And so it's amazing knowing that in seven hours that much money transacted into, you know, directly into the pockets of art local artisans. And I'd say about half of them do this as their life income. Um, some of them just do it, you know, on the side. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it is successful, and I can't, I don't have an exact number, but I imagine over 5,000 people. It's very claustrophobic, and I'm very aware of it. It's really packed in, and we've changed things up every single year. We've moved to a larger and larger venue um, just to try to be able to, to fit people in a space that's um, inviting and trying, really trying <laughs> to expand it so that there is... Um, an opportunity for a lot of local artists to participate, but at the same time having room to shop is really important because if people don't shop, it won't help. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and one thing we are doing um, new, and this is a formal announcement. Um, so we are introducing, um, we started an LLC called Handmade Montana, and it's um, an organization that will comprise of three components. It's to expand on this and give more people opportunities um, and be able to give back and create this, um, you know, the sh a show, but also an educational opportunity. So it, it's um, three parts. There's an event series, which will be the, the two made fairs, um, holiday and the summer one. And we'd like to maybe eventually expand into other markets like Helena and Bozeman, maybe Billings, but that's really far away. So we'll see. Um, <laughs> and then as part of the events, having um, a retail wholesale kind of show so local retailers can come in and purchase products if they wanted to. And I think that part's going to be pretty small to start with. It's not going to be anywhere near the like Made in Montana show that was recently in Helena. Um, another component is an educational component offering basic classes. I've been doing this, like I said, for almost 10 years and I've learned a lot of stuff along the way. There's a lot of free resources available to, to people if they know how to access them. Um, so we'll have little workshops on how to build from your living room to <laughs> or kitchen into, you know, this is your full-time thing. Um, one of the artists that works with us, um, Courtney Blazon, she's a fine artist, so she'll be able to present information about how to take your fine art and transform it into your livelihood. Um, I think we just need to move on. Okay. Um, but I don't, I yes, no, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah, so well, that, that's it. <laughs> okay, sounds Thank good. You. <laughs> I can talk about myself so forever, apparently. <laughs> that was fascinating. And I know many of us have been to the Mayfair and are really so called Lane.
Uh, good morning. Uh, so I've got actually sort of three hats here in town. Uh, one is uh, as founder of my business, MuseView, which I'm going to spend a, um, two or three minutes talking about. Uh, the other is uh, with Dawn McGee, uh, co-founder of the Hellgate Venture Network, which has existed for a little over six years now, uh, which is here to help um, entrepreneurial businesses and kind of network the entrepreneurial community. We meet kind of once a month. Um, over beer and we have an entrepreneur kind of sharing their story for 10 minutes, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and then more recently, about six weeks ago, I took on the role of the director of the Blackstone Launchpad at the university, which is uh, our mission is to help students and alumni that want to start their own business uh, and really kind of pursue their passion by starting a business or starting an organization through which they can explore that. So uh, I'm very interested in kind of helping kind of local businesses. And in, in six weeks, we've already had about 58 students and alumni that have registered with us and about 23 business ideas that have been submitted. So wow. I'm hoping to see a lot of kind of exciting new businesses arising here in kind of Missoula and across Montana over the, over the coming months. So um, my agenda, if you want to so go to the next, next slide. Uh, so you can't do it. I don't think the click will work on this. I shouldn't think. Oh no, it does. Wee. Awesome. Google's even smarter than I thought they were. <laughs> Excellent. Um, it doesn't want to stay there. No, it doesn't. There we go. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to spend two or three minutes talking about my business muse view from a sort of sustainability perspective. Um, and then Jenny had asked me to talk about sort of innovative business and finance models. So I'm going to try and give you in about kind of six minutes <laughs> some kind of principles of innovation and kind of funding of your businesses. Uh, that hopefully you can sort of take away and apply to kind of move your business to the, to the next level. Uh, I've got a set of innovation questions. I'll run through those really, really quickly. Um, I'll be happy to kind of share these kind of slides with people that um, think there's anything that I said that's actually interesting and useful. Um, so my business muse view is very, very different to a lot of certainly the two businesses we've heard about from kind of Mark and Carol. Um, and uh, kind of many of the other businesses that you may think of as sort of sustainable businesses. So MuseView basically is a sort of content curation business uh, in the business and kind of financial services world. So we track and aggregate marketing activities from leading professional services firms. Uh, we also track the changes in regulations from securities exchanges. So places like the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and Chicago Board of Exchange have very complicated rule books that they're constantly updating. And our team monitors that process, tracks it, puts the information in the database, and then we deliver a file uh, to our client every day that they can use to update kind of their internal um, systems. So uh, the pictures there are two of our longest serving employees. Uh, all of our employees, except for myself and, and my two business partners, are stay at home moms down in the Bitterroot. Um, Marcy was giving me uh, grief last night for not saying we also would employ stay-at-home dads and we did actually have one for about two years uh, and we're certainly open to employing stay-at-home dads um, but our, our stay-at-home moms um, I mean it's it's remarkable to me that we've got sort of high-powered financial executives and lawyers and um, partners in CPA firms that are relying on information that's essentially kind of processed um, by stay-at-home moms in the Bitterroot who <laughs> frankly and, and self-admittedly would say they don't necessarily know a heck of a lot about financial services regulation or kind of legal issues but we've been able to develop a process that enables them to manage and organize that information effectively so then when I looked last night at kind of all of the kind of the nine sustainable kind of business practices I realized we're probably a highly kind of sustainable business because we have probably a close to zero um, carbon footprint um, because essentially all our employees work from home uh, so we have no transportation, all of our activities are online, um, we have no facilities, everyone works from home, we don't have a headquarters, uh, we very rarely travel to meet with our clients, we do all of that by phone and email and sort of go to meeting type activities and sessions. So really about our only consumption of any kind of resource or energy, uh, of resources is, is energy, the powers, the servers and the computers that, that our people use. Um, so really what we're about, and it's sort of interesting putting this together and kind of thinking about us sort of exporting sustainable brain power, that's I think what we're trying to do um, with the, um, uh, the launch pad in many ways is 
is use one of um, kind of Montana's perhaps most underutilized resources, which is its brain power. And actually, rather than export it by sending our people out of state to use their creativity and knowledge and skills, and particularly leverage technology to um, sort of export that um, insight to clients and customers across the world uh, without them having to, to move there. So that's uh, a little bit about MuseView. Um, so to get into the sort of innovation and kind of business models piece, and this sort of reflects a lot of my kind of background and kind of the work I've done over the years, um, sort of both in the corporate world. So some of the terms and some of the examples I'm going to give here are kind of big business examples. But I, what, what I want you to take away from it is not, gee, I want to copy those kind of businesses and do the same things as those businesses, but learn from some of the principles that they've applied that help them innovate and create and therefore compete more effectively in their marketplaces. And the way I think about innovation as distinct from invention, so invention is sort of creating some thing which sort of might be useful but might not, but often doesn't necessarily have any real commercial value. Innovation is, is something that's really creating value, and the most important aspect of that is really creating customer value. So for me, innovation is about how do you sort of adapt your business, your products and services, the way you market, the way you operate, to deliver better value for your customers. And usually when you do that, in, many, in the same way that I think a lot of sustainability practices do that, that the time that you, that you spend doing those things, you actually come up with a better, more effective, and more efficient business model by adopting some of those kind of principles and practices. So if you think about customer value, think about all of the things that customers take into their consideration of the products and services that they might buy from you. Now, I put brand at the top, which in many ways sort of correlates to, to value, but if you think about certain brands, you will have some association or some perception of them, good or bad, about what their products or services mean to you. And often it's an amalgam of these other things. So price is obviously always important, but it's often not the most important um, piece. Uh, the quality of the products, the quality of the services, time can be a factor for people in terms of speed. Uh, convenience is a massive issue in today's uh, society. Quality of service, whether that's the service you provide or after sales service. Uh, sustainability, um, I, I think the important thing I think in today's world is that sustainability is clearly a very valuable and very powerful um, kind of movement and concept. I don't think it necessarily is always going to be sufficient for you just to say, hey, we're sustainable, therefore you should buy our products and services. So you need to put it in the context of some of these other things. So are your products kind of highly usable? Is the design uh, great? What else are you doing in terms of flexibility and risk and choice and customization? I'm going to talk about some of those things, give you some quick examples in a minute. So think about what is it that your customers value and do as much as you can to align your products and your services and your operations to what customers value. So to give you a few examples, and I say these are mostly, although one or two are local examples, mostly kind of big, big corporation, big world examples, but I, I, I want you to kind of take away the principle that sits behind them. So Orange was, um, is one of the, the, the major kind of cell phone service providers in, in the UK and Europe. When they came into the market, they were the fourth mobile operator to enter the market, but they were the first operator to essentially flip the model for how you price mobile service. So when cell phone service was launched, because it was launched mostly by existing telephone companies, they used the same pricing model which says, we're going to price you for minutes uh, and we're going to bill you at the end of the month. And when they did that and they charged kind of a dollar a minute or whatever it was to start with, um, People were like, well, I'm going to have to be very cautious about using my service because I'm going to end up with this kind of $100, $200 kind of bill by the end of the month. And they introduced the concept of uh, a fixed kind of bundle of minutes, which suddenly changed the dynamics because people now knew that they bought 100 minutes or 50 minutes or whatever it is, and they knew how much money they were going to be spending. So they'd removed the risk for customers of overspending because it was, it was a built-in mechanism by which they would know uh, how much money they were spending. And actually what Orange found when they put that in was actually their average revenue per minute went up because people were controlling themselves to stay below their kind of um, their minutes limit. So there are things you can do with pricing that can change the dynamics because it's not just about the cost, it's about certainty. And this is why, given I spend a lot of time in the legal world, this is why people mostly hate lawyers because they um, basically send bills at the end of the month which, which people had 
very little control over. And there's a lot of innovation going on in the legal world now around fixed price arrangements and value billing, which is starting to change that industry very slowly. Um, payment terms, uh, Virgin Mobile, at least in the UK, was the first cell phone operator um, to go with a pay-as-you-go model, so the prepaid model, um, which means that you're paying up front, which again was about confidence um, on the part of the consumer, but also actually had far greater implications outside of um, kind of the UK and developed markets because it meant suddenly in undeveloped markets where people didn't have credit profiles and cell phone companies wouldn't want to give those customers a contract, they could actually provide cell phone service because people were paying up front. Um, and paying up front is something I'll, I'll come back to, is a phenomenally powerful way of changing your kind of business model. It can actually potentially add value, but it also tells you a heck of a lot about how much customers actually value your products and services. Uh, subscriptions, um, uh, the icon there is um, kind of Dollar Shave Club. Uh, I don't know how many of you heard about that, but that's essentially a subscription service for kind of razors, uh, for shaving. I mean, just completely flipped the model for kind of shaving uh, gear and equipment. Uh, Amazon Prime, I don't know how many people here are Amazon Prime customers, but that kind of flat rate, okay, it's 70 bucks a year. I kind of get access to this kind of shipping um, and it's, um, I don't have to worry about kind of shipping costs beyond that and I get kind of free, free movies and things to watch. How am I doing time-wise? It's been 11. It's been 11? Mm -hmm. Holy cow. Um, so let me talk uh, for a minute on innovative finance. So there's some other examples there I'll be happy to talk to you about kind of offline. I hear people talk about I can't get funding for my business and I think often that's basically a crutch or an excuse for I haven't figured out how to get value to create value for my customers. So if you think about what funding does is it bridges the gap between customer payment and cost outlays. So innovation, I think, is the way in which you can try and shorten or reverse that gap by getting people to pay up front um, or by reducing the size of that gap by essentially enabling you to get customers to pay more because you've focused more on the value or by reducing your cost because you've eliminated, and there are some other examples on the previous slide of things that you can take out of your uh, business processes because actually you're doing things that customers don't value or in some instances you're doing things that customers would actually rather do themselves. So let them do it so you don't incur the cost. And the best example or a, a great example of innovative finance I think is crowdfunding which Market on Front which Mark showed a kind of picture of earlier um, and a couple of other businesses here in town have done is basically sort of Kickstarter campaigns. That for me is a phenomenal way of getting money up front but equally importantly, getting customer validation. If you have a Kickstarter campaign and nobody signs up, they probably don't like your products and services. If you're massively oversubscribed, people clearly love something that you're doing and that's probably a pretty good indication and you've got the money up front to work on that. So, um, sorry I went over, but uh, hopefully that was of some help. There's a set of questions there. As I say, I'd be happy to share the slides. And, and Paul is available as a community resource, which Absolutely. is part of why we wanted to highlight him today. So thank you so much, Paul. That's great. So our last speaker, of course, is Judy Wicks. And, uh well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I've met most of you already <laughs> over the last couple of days. I've been in Missoula. I uh, really enjoyed my visit here. Uh, and in particular, I really enjoyed um, seeing and he hearing from um, the local business people. Um, really enjoyed the shops and a Buttercup uh, Market and Cafe and uh, Mark and Paul and Carol and Carol Lynn's uh, <laughs> businesses are really fascinating to me. Uh, so I talked almost an hour last night, and I know many of you were there, so I'm trying to think of some things that I didn't say last night. Uh, but when I started The White Dog um, in uh, 1983, I had never heard of sustainability or fair trade or living wage or any of the things that The White Dog became known for eventually. Uh, I just wanted to have a, a, a neighborhood cafe where my friends could gather and um, eat um, good food and have conversations. Uh, the first uh, vision I had about my cafe uh, were, were the curtains. <laughs> I was imagining uh, blue and white checked uh, cafe curtains uh, because to me that represented um, old fashioned uh, hospitality. So I really built the cafe um, around those curtains in a sense, uh, starting with that. Um, that first vision. Uh, one of the things I did know I wanted to do was to buy from local farms and at that point the local food movement had not started. So it wasn't like I was trying to start a movement or I was trying to join a movement or anything else. Uh, I had uh, managed a, 
a uh, French restaurant for 10 years, and I was just sick of all those heavy cream sauces and imported ingredients, you know, Dover sole and all this stuff, <laughs> escargot. Um, and I wanted to have food that I enjoyed when I was growing up. I wanted to uh, have a menu, put on my menu, um, Nana's strawberry pie, which was my favorite pie that my grandmother made. And I wanted Betty's shish kebabs, which was my mother's fav favorite uh, dish. And um, my family had a big garden, and um, I watched my mother and my grandmother stew tomatoes and do all this canning and jarring every August and September uh, and freeze. And um, my grandmother made all these pies that she put in the um, freezer that we could enjoy throughout the year. So I was really going, in a sense, back to my roots. I wanted to have my favorite childhood treats. I made sure I had a hot fudge Sundays and root beer floats on the menu. You know? uh, and I actually uh, uh, had root beer that came out of a, 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 um, a, you know, a, dra a beer, uh, what do you call it, a keg um, in the beginning. And uh, it, it, it lost its place as beer became more popular <laughs> than the root beer. But uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of where, where I started with all this. And really, I, I, my business taught me as I, as I moved along. I, I ran the business for 26 years. And um, I like to think that we were a learning organization, that I was always learning and applying what I learned um, to the white dog. And learning and education actually became a product um, besides uh, food and service you know, of our business. Um, so we started having many kinds of events. One of the frustrations I had in running a small business, especially a restaurant, is that it takes so much time. It takes your whole life, basically. <laughs> um, so uh, all the things that I cared about uh, that um, normally you do as a volunteer, uh, volunteer or you serve on boards and nonprofits or whatever, uh, I, I didn't have the time for. So it was really a, tam a time management um, solution, in a sense, that I started uh, bringing into my business all the different things that I cared about by having educational programs about them. You know, I, wanted, I was really concerned about uh, drug policy, you know, and all the people being locked up for marijuana, which I think is like a, a miracle drug. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I started having pro programs on, um, on um, drug policy and inviting uh, Ethan Nadelman, uh, you know, to come and speak. And luckily, Philadelphia is very close to New York and D.C., so I had access to a lot of speakers. So all the things I wanted to ed be educated about and wanted my customers, my staff to know about, I brought into the cafe through all these different events that I went into more detail about in my talk last night. Um, so um, uh, let's see. Uh, I should tell you, and I didn't talk about this last night, uh, that, that our, our mission, um, uh, I always feel that the purpose of business is to serve. So our, our mission was to serve fully in four areas, serving our customers, of course, serving our employees, serving our community, and serving nature. So um, when I would make a decision, I wouldn't make a decision based on how much money is this going to make, although that was a factor. Uh, but uh, how will this serve these four constituencies? Um, and it was more for me about maximizing relationships as opposed to maximizing profits. And I think that's what made it a healthy business because uh, I think financial, when you maximize those relationships, you know, with your customers, with your staff, with your community, and with nature, um, then, you know, to, to a large extent, uh, uh, you know, profitability follows. Um, but I don't want to say that I did not, someone was pointing out uh, today that I have a good business head, and that's, <laughs> that's true. I, I, I think it's a kind of a, natu a natural thing. Um, I, you know, I, I would make a commitment to, for instance, um, give away a certain percentage of my profits uh, to nonprofits. And during the year, I was always writing checks and thinking I'm going to give them money to them. And at the, at the end, I'd ask my bookkeeper, well, where am I on, you know, uh, in terms of percentage of of uh, profit, and I would get it almost exactly right, just intuitively. I could sense like how we were doing and how much I was giving away, and so on. Uh, I don't know exactly what you call that, but but I think intuition um, is a really important part of the way I ran my business. Um, and um, in my book, I talk about uh, two uh, contradictory uh, yet simultaneous energies. Uh, that I called um, Will and Grace, not like the TV show. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, I, I compare it to whitewater canoeing, um, that uh, the grace is kind of a surrender, um, knowing that um, you don't know everything uh, and that there's power is much greater than yourself in the, in the universe. It's kind of a spiritual thing. And that you surrender uh, to, to the greater power to, uh, and your, your oneness uh, uh, with the world. And so when you're whitewater canoeing, it's sort of like um, uh, being in the, in the flow. You know, uh, your, your canoe or whatever is, is, is in the flow. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, you could go right over a waterfall, you know, or whatever. Uh, you have to have will. Uh, you, you're a human being. Not only are you uh, at one with the world, but you also are an individual who has a, has choice, uh, to, choices to make. And so you use your paddle to um, um, to make decisions, to influence your your journey, uh, to get to the shore, to 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 you know. So it's these two. Uh, simultaneous um, energies of surrender and taking action at, so, uh, at the same time, in a sense. Um, and you can see sometimes I see people in my life, they're too much about will, you know, too much figuring like they know it all, they're going to do it this way, it's all in their head, and so on. Uh, and other people, they're too much about grace, they're kind of like floating down the river, <laughs> you know, uh, waiting for things to happen to them, you know. Uh, so it's the kind of that balance that I feel um, that has made me a good business person. Um, and um, it's, it's really the way uh, I try to lead my life. Um, and it's sort of related a little bit to um, the management style that I developed. When I was first a young manager, uh, I felt very uncomfortable managing people. I, I actually always felt uncomfortable <laughs> managing people. Even That's why I finally ended up selling the business after 40 years of being an entrepreneur. I had enough of that <laughs> managing people. I, but anyway, uh, I, uh, I was trying to think, well, how do I, what is my management style, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I, I thought about um, how my mother raised us, how I was raising my own kids, how I work with my dogs, whatever, uh, how I manage my own life. Um, and it's really, again, um, this balance or simultaneous energies. In this case, I talk about it um, as, um, uh, uh, spontaneity, creativity, uh, individuality, um, and at the same time, structure, discipline, um, you know, uh, and control. Um, and um, I, I, I thought, you know, how, you know how, how do you really kind of explain this? And then I, uh, I was reading, um, or someone gave me a quote from Thomas Berry, uh, and he was talking about the, the earth itself. Do I have to hold this up? Or I can just put it here, right? Well, you, right. I have to. Really all right, I'm going to stick on here. Um, so that the earth itself um, is in this balance, that the forces that are kind of ex um, exploding from earth are going out. And this is the, the kind of um, spontaneity and so on. And then there's the force of gravity that's the control um, and the structure that's holding those forces at bay. Uh, and if either force is, is, is too much, uh, the Earth would either explode, because uh, there's too much uh, spontaneity and whatnot, or implode, because there's too much structure. And Earth is, to is perfectly balanced. And it, at that point of balance is where uh, life on Earth is. It's where creativity lies. So when I thought of uh, how my mother's classroom was always the noisiest classroom in the elementary school, um, it was because she was operating at that point of balance. Um, she was allowing as much freedom as possible uh, within the constraints of the classroom. Um, and that's where uh, the most creativity was allowed to happen. And so I feel like that's what I try to do in my business. Uh, I try to give as much freedom to my employees as I possibly could uh, within the, the confines and the control um, uh, you know, of, uh, of the business. Um, you know, we had written job descriptions. Uh, that was their job. But if they wanted to change that job, uh, please, the job descriptions are, uh, you know, ongoing uh, process and let me know how you would like to change your job description. Um, so it's that balance and I feel like it's also the balance of how we lead our lives. Um, that we, you know, to uh, be creative, be spontaneous and whatnot, uh, but also to structure our, our energies um, into a, a productive uh, process. Um, so I, d I thought I would just share that uh, with you. Uh, did I run out of time already? Or, 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 you're about uh, well, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't really have to say anything more. <laughs> because I, <laughs> I think we have Q&A, so people yeah, can ask Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, why don't, why don't I, oh, there's one little thing I did, I did want to say in terms of the, the, the mission of service, that uh, every year um, uh, to, to, to look at how we had done in those four areas of service, uh, you know, uh, customers, employees, um, community, and uh, nature, uh, I had um, what I call the anniversary howl, like this kind of howl, ooh. <laughs> so we would close the restaurant uh, one night, uh, usually a Sunday night, uh, the slowest after the first seating, um, and have, a, have an event just for the employees. Um, 
and um, I would have a, I would give a state of the dog address, you know, <laughs> and uh, a, a open book management show what our profit and loss was, how I, how I used the profit, um, and many other things. We give awards, you know, Silver Bone Award, blah blah blah. Um, but we also talked about um, how we had accomplished our mission, and and I would use that as a um, um, a, a goal in a sense that during the year. Uh, I wanted to be able to announce at the how one more thing that we were doing to serve our employees, for instance. Um, sometimes it would be increasing benefits for uh, tipped employees, and most restaurants, no, no tipped employees get benefits. Um, and so every year I would give a little bit more uh, benefits, you know, to our tipped employees. Uh, or I realized that so many of our um, employees were, didn't have computers, so we would loan, loan the, the money for their first computer and then they would, would pay back from. Anyway, that kind of stuff. And so it's just like a, a time of the year, you know, and I wanted to be able to announce uh, every year at the How and also on our Green Dog Day, <laughs> which is open to our customers, uh, one more um, uh, uh, sustainable practice uh, that we had developed during that year, whether it's putting solar. Um, hot water panels on the roof or starting a communal uh, compost or whatever. Um, anyway, I'll stop there you know, for questions and so on. Okay. Um. Well, thank you so much to each of our panelists and I just wanted to say thanks again to Judy. Um, for those of you who missed her talk um, last night, it will be on uh, MCAT and on YouTube eventually. Thank you so much to MCAT for um, filming these events. And her book also tells the stories of many more stories like the ones she, you've just been hearing. So um, I know a number of you heard, heard her talk last night. Thank you, Mark and Carolyn and Paul. Paul? Paul? I'm trying to learn how to say it in the British way. <laughs> <laughs> um, what questions do you have for our, for our guests? What would you like to know? Pat? And please pass the mic to whoever is going So I was interested in, in the idea of growth. And growth and sustainability sort of are opposite ends of the spectrum. But Carolyn, you said you wanted to know how to grow. You were the business school helps you figure that out. How do you, how does an entrepreneur in a in a sustainable business view growth philosophically? Well, Carolyn's the one who's said it, but I'd love to hear an answer from anybody. Thanks, Pat. Who would like to take that on? Carolyn, do you want to address it, or will we pass the mic? Sure. Um, so, to rephrase the question, I'm supposed to do that first, right? Or yes. say it again. <laughs> um, how do I philosophically kind of believe about growth and sustainability, and how the two can be happen in a business? Um, I think. It's hard to, to grow and maintain that sustainability um, and figure out what the steps necessary are to kind of hold on to your original intent of the business, which mine was fully sustainable and, and uh, a green business focus. Um, it's just always kind of coming back around to that when thinking of any changes um, in the business structure and in production and um, not exactly sure. I'm still learning it. <laughs> um, but it's something I do think about all the time and, and in my decision making process of um, when I'm thinking consciously about what to do next kind of thing. And for me specifically, it's you know the supply chain of raw materials to transform. It's, um, it's kind of interesting. Do I drive 500 miles to Seattle to shop for t-shirts? That doesn't make sense because that's kind of against what um, I believe in. So it's, I think it has to happen organically and, and consciously. Yeah, I think what you said at the end there about growing organically, it should be growth because sort of the, the market wants to see that growth because you're delivering, as I talked about, delivering value to, to customers. It's the, where it goes wrong is the growth for growth's sake, as Judy was saying last night in kind of the the investment world that sort of once you're beholden to the stock markets you're expected to grow year in year out and find new ways to try and grow and to cut costs out because it's for the investors benefit not for the um, and, I, and I think I mean sustainability is an interesting term I mean it has these meanings in terms of sort of using kind of resources kind of effectively and uh, kind of being local and things like that but I think it's also about 
building a business that is sustainable, a, that it's going to be around for a long time because it continues to deliver value. And I think there's a lot of businesses that have grown too fast um, without thought for that, and they've kind of failed ultimately because of that. So I think um, you pursue growth where growth makes sense and where that's what your customers are telling you that they want. And if you're a sustainable business, then you're going to focus on delivering those customer needs in a sustainable way. I uh, just wanted to add a, a little bit to that. Um, uh, one of the things that I thought about once I, I grew very quickly um, in the first five years, and you know, uh, I think you have to grow to a financially s sustainable point as well. You know, um, and I think uh, most of the businesses in this room are probably still growing and still need to grow, um, and it's good for the community to grow. Um, but um, at some point, uh, for me, uh, when I realized I was financially sustainable and I didn't have to grow any larger in terms of my footprint and so on, uh, I thought about uh, the idea of, of um, spreading our models as opposed to spreading our brands. Um, so I started teaching about the model of the white dog in other communities. I, I wasn't trying to start white dogs in other people's communities, um, but I was willing to share my model. And I think one of the beauties of the local economy movement is that, for the most part, we're not competing. Uh, in the national marketplace. Um, so if we come up with a, a good model uh, that works in our community of food processing business or you know whatever, um, we can share that model with somebody in another city because we're not competing on, in the national marketplace in that way. Um, so and that's one of the things that Bali does is to help uh, you know, spread these models. Um, but I, I was also, I, I wanted to hear from you, Mark, because I'm very fascinated by your business and how you have those different aspects of your business with the sawmill and so on. And, and, and to me, one of the ways to grow is to look to see what is it that my community needs that might be related uh, to my business. You know, um, uh, there's a really great model of, the, of growth in um, um, uh, Ann Arbor, uh, a deli called Zingerman's, a very famous deli. Instead of doing a national chain of delis, they looked to see what does my uh, a community need. Uh, well, they didn't have a creamery, so they started a creamery uh, to make ice cream and cheeses. Uh, their community didn't have a fair trade roast coffee roasting company, so they started a coffee roasting company. Um, they were all uh, businesses that related to their own business, um, and um, many more. I think they have 12 different businesses, and, and plus they were able to make um, their best employees owners, you know, in, in those new businesses. So they have a family of businesses uh, with many owners, uh, a team of, of owners. And I think that's a great model. And I was thinking of that when I was hearing about your business, I'd like to hear a bit more about the way that you grew. Oh, well, we, we started out, I started out with a 65 Ford F-250 and a chainsaw. Um, <laughs> I've still got them both, and uh, they both run very well. Um, I think we're all kind of saying the same thing. You've got to be organic, and you've got to only grow as the services are needed by your community, right. and, and that's that's how we did it. Um, we don't. We didn't get any big loans or anything else. Um, so we just grew organically as folks wanted our services. We moved into those places, and and that's all there was to it. Mm -hmm. So now we're running about 14 folks when we're at full tilt, um, and it's uh, and we don't have to worry about that um, that that uh, division between sustainability and growth because we're founded in uh, what you might call sustainability even though that word's getting a little fuzzy these days. Um, so we don't have to worry about that, and our growth is slow enough that we don't, uh, we don't really worry about it either. We've been around for 20-something years, so it's been slow, and that's the way to do it. Um, I feel that a lot of folks get a big chunk of money, um, grant or loan, and that's, <coughs> that's, uh, they're dangling just enough carrot to get you into trouble. And so, you, so growing organically has been uh, a real safe way to do it. Can we, um, I just want to acknowledge that this event was supposed to end at 9.30. So I'm going to take one more question um, and invite people to linger and talk with our guests. Um, we have so much innovation in this community. Would you like to? Yeah, just I wanted to touch on that sustainability, the fuzziness of sustainability question. And, you know, people talk about greenwashing. And where do you all see the term sustainability, sometimes we talk at Bad Goat about, oh, let's just keep that word out of all of our marketing <laughs> materials if we're done with it. Is there a sense out there with you guys that are, are we beyond that term? Is that term almost becoming detrimental to use or overplayed and losing its meaning? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's the comment I made sort of about sustainability and that set of kind of customer value that it's it's difficult uh, increasingly, I think, for you to differentiate on that because the term has become so so kind of fuzzy and so overused that just saying it, um, I think people are going to start to kind of glaze over. So you've really got to be, um, when, it's, when the definition is fuzzy, you need to be clear about what your definition is um, and make sure that that's the definition you're comfortable with and that those are the values that your customers and your employees and your community values. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. You can't just say sustainability or say some other word that you think sort of means the same thing. You need to be clear about what it is. And um, I mean, I think your philosophy of sort of transparency in the business and open book management, I think that's, I think most good sustainable businesses are very transparent uh, about how they operate and kind of what they do. So I think that's probably your best way to pursue it in, in the face of what I think is a, a clear issue and challenge. I think for um, my business stuff, it's always been, um, it's not the focus, it's the um, kind of an end result, I guess, is making products and having, um, like the made for having it be a local show and having it be able to stand on its own and then people finding out that it is a sustainable green business supporting the local economy is an added bonus. Um, and because, yeah, it's definitely green business, sustainable, all those words are kind of definitely be being used uh, a little too much, um, even if a company isn't that themselves, I guess. <laughs> yeah, not much I can add to that. <laughs> uh, well, well, only that, I mean, I, I not thought of a better word is the only problem. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I like to think of sustainability as being really uh, uh, in three ways. Um, you know, environmentally sustainable, but also socially sustainable, uh, as well as financially sustainable. And we sometimes don't think enough about socially sustainable, uh, which is, you know, really about um, equality uh, and inclusiveness, um, that we're not sustain sustainable as a, as a, uh, as a society um, un unless we have fairness and inclusion. Um, and um, one of the words that uh, we use in the, in, the, in the Bali movement is living, um, as a, uh, that can be used instead of sustainable. Uh, in some cases, um, that um, a living economy uh, rather than a sustainable economy is one that supports life, both community life and, and natural life, as well as long-term uh, financial life. Um, so sometimes I use that terminology, um, you know, creating a living economy rather than a sustainable economy. But that's the only other word I've actually been able to um, use in the same way. Um, but if anybody comes up with any other better words, I think we're all looking for them because we do get sick of hearing about sustainable. And there is a reaction. I mean, the right, the right wing, uh, of course, hates the word. Um, and I, I heard in North Carolina, they actually pa passed a law that they're not going to use sustainable in any of their legislation <laughs> or sustainability. You know, uh, is, is that crazy? Well, um, as the executive director of the Sustainable Business Council of Missoula. <laughs> I feel like I need to weigh in on this issue and say that we, you know, we took on that name at a time when it was very innovative and really forward thinking and it really meant very much what Judy said, that it's about being financially sustainable and ecologically sustainable and socially sustainable. And you know, another definition that's very common is to, to operate in such a way that um, we aren't compromising um, any of those resources for future generations. And those are high ideals and it's hard to live up to and people try and fall short in many ways. All of us fall short in many ways no matter how much we're dedicated to it. And so I want to just really thank you for the question and say that what I see as our role in, in this conversation is to keep having the conversation. So we have a community that we we all love and we all want it to be healthy and vibrant and living um, and our, it's our relationships that make that happen and part of our relationships is to have conversations where we might not agree about what a definition means or something like that so one of the things that we'll be doing as our mission of um, advancing a vibrant local economy built on sustainable practices is helping to encourage conversation about what do we mean by local, what do we mean by sustainable, and how do we agree as a community to come to what that means so that it really is a living economy. So I am so grateful for all of our panelists. Thank you this morning. Um, yes, thank you. 
And I want to say a special thank you to Judy Wicks for coming from Philadelphia and for leading this amazing uh, movement that we get to be part of, of the, of the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies and for telling your story. Thank you for joining us for these days. Thank you. And um, we have little gifts for each of you that I'll, I'll give you. And I just want to say thanks to all of you for coming. And please um, do participate in, in the Sustainable Business Council. Come to events if you'd like. Um, uh, J Judy will be here signing her book. And um, she's available to talk with you. And uh, our other panelists are available to talk with you. I also want to say that the Sustainable Business Council is at a really exciting time of growth. We have an amazing staff and board, and I'm really grateful to them for their support for all these events. Um, and we also have, we're a 501c3 organization, and we've just received a $5,000 matching gift. So if anybody is in a position to make a donation to help us build our local living economy, we would be very grateful, and that would be matched, doubled. Um, and also, um, we're appreciative for all of our members for your dues and your sponsorship support. Um, and this is a great time to join if you have not become a member. We will be raising our, our rates probably in the near future, so this is a fantastic time to join. So <laughs> thanks for everybody. Okay. Continue to stay as long as you'd like. Thanks again.